stage. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alexis Douglas. I am the co-chair of the Chicago Bar Association's Creative Arts Committee. Um, and I worked with Ross for the last three months or so um, on putting this event together. And I'll say that Ross has done so much work and an incredible job. The attention to detail has been um, fantastic. So a lot of work has gone into putting this day together. And we're really excited to welcome all of you. And thank you so much for coming, everyone in person and those of you listening online. Um, for the people listening online, you can, I think you got instructions on how to ask questions. Um, shoot an email over to our email address or gchat us. And um, Priya will answer, well, not answer the question. She'll raise her hand and pretend like she's asking a question on your behalf. Um, so if you guys, if the panelists could all um, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ross to give you a little background on how this day got started. And then our panel will happen. So thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you, everybody. Welcome to the first ever Chicago Video Game Law Summit. Um, we're going to get started here in just a couple minutes. First, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in making this happen today. I want to thank Alexis and Jenny at the CBA for helping us get CLE credit for hosting us here at the CBA, for working out 100 little details. I want to thank all of my organizers, with, uh, the Video Game Law Society, and Suzanne, of course. John Marshall, which has been awesome in letting us be a society and has given us a lot of help putting this all together. I want to thank all of our sponsors and all of our speakers who made it here today, despite there being snow. Um, half of them flew in from out of state for this and are donating their time and money away from their families, so I really want to thank them. And of course, I want to thank Kent, who also helped out with a lot of the details here. Whew. So, sorry about the snow. We wanted to give you all the authentic Chicago experience, but there you are, especially the people from Chicago and uh, New York who have been living through this all year. Now we can make people from California pay. <laughs> um, Chicago Video Game Law Summit was an idea that we had about a year ago. Um, Suzanne, my other organizer, and I, we were at a comic book convention. We were listening to a panel about comic book law. And it was very well done, but we were kind of sad we didn't see any discussion about video games and how the law treats video games differently from other kinds of media. So we decided, why don't we have our own panel about video games? But then we couldn't decide what kind of panel to have. We didn't know if we wanted to talk just about IP, if we wanted to talk about business, if we wanted to reach out to developers. And since we're gluttons for punishment, we decided to do all three. Or all four. Or all five, because we have five panels today. Um, so the schedule for today, we're going to be starting with the discussion of video game violence, how content is regulated in video games, the public policies thereof. Then we're going to be talking about some recent developments in video games, how video game practitioners apply the laws that we have that were either made for games or not made to games, and apply them to games. After that, we're going to be working on the journalism panel. We're going to be talking about free speech issues in digital media, games, and things like Gamergate, things like harassment, things about social context. We're going to be talking about the business of video games after that, anything from transactional work to filing to business and corporations, startups, how that affects video games or how it doesn't affect video games. And finally, we'll be closing out the day with a discussion of independent video games, how they're made, how they're developed, how they're published, what game developers need to know about IP, what they want from lawyers and representation. And then we'll be closing out with an hour's worth of networking ourselves. You can all get together, meet, talk, interface, get to know each other. Um, a little bit about me, my name is Ross Herzman. I founded the Video Game Law Society just at the start of this year through John Marshall. I just graduated from John Marshall. Um, I'm very privileged to know all of the sponsors that we have here today and all of our speakers today who have been doing a great job with us and teaching all of us about video games. So with that is my introduction for CBGLS. Um, I think we can get started rolling into the video game violence panel. So I'll ask all of our speakers to introduce themselves and we'll start. Yeah, I'm Talmadge Wright. I'm in the Department of Sociology at Loyola University, and I teach a course, Sociology of uh, Play, as well as uh, Mass Media. Uh, Bill Ford. I'm an associate professor at the John Marshall Law School, where I teach intellectual property courses and also the video game law course. I'm J. Michael Monahan. I'm here so I don't get fined. No, I uh, <laughs> am a... Uh, Soft intellectual property technology lawyer. I also teach a video game law course uh, at uh, Chicago Kent. I'm Doc Mack. I'm the uh, owner of Galloping Ghost Productions. Uh, we're working on an arcade game called Dark Presence, and also the owner of the Galloping Ghost Arcade, which is the largest arcade in the world. And it's local. It's, it's local. local. Yeah. Brookfield. Oh, yeah. 
Um, so I think the way that we'll start is I have a couple questions for our panelists. We'll see what direction that takes us in. We'll talk for a good chunk of the hour, and then afterwards I invite all of you to ask questions. Um, I only have so many questions of my own. I want to get to what all of you want to know from our panelists, so let's benefit from their experience. And let's get started with what is the video game violence debate? Where did it come from? How did it start? Some of it started in comic books. Some of it started in pinball. Um, how did we get to where we are? Uh, well, as far as pinball, pinball was controversial, uh, but the, the controversy about pinball was tied to its potential use as a gambling device. So mm -hmm. while we could look at pinball as one of the earliest examples of games generating a controversy, it's not really content related. Um, instead, it's, it's a concern about uh, mob ties to pinball, uses of pinball for gambling and things like that. So um, as far as game controversies, I would set pinball aside. Uh, the video game violence debate really starts in the mid-1970s with a brief surge of interest over a release of a game called Death Race by Exidy, which involved automobiles driving over little stick figure gremlins. And it was denounced for its violence, although if you look at the imagery, it's almost comical that this game would have raised any sort of controversy. Um, but that's the first example of a video game generating controversy over violence. Now, in the years after that, I think most of the controversy over video games was more tied to uh, things like uh, uh, the environment of the arcade and whether or not children in arcades would be exposed to drug dealers or other unsavory people, curfew uh, problems or truancy problems or things like that. So I think if you look at the early concerns about the arcade, with the, with the brief exception of Death Race, it was more about that. And it's really not until we get into the 90s with the release of games like Mortal Kombat uh, that the video game violence debate really becomes uh, a, a very noteworthy, interesting thing to talk about and starts to generate public policy debates uh, that go well beyond what had happened earlier. Now, in, in between, there are a few controversial things. There are uh, some pornographic or, or sort of pornographic video games released for the Atari 2600. There's a brief controversy over that. There's some controversy over games like Dungeons and Dragons for their occult ties. And uh, I actually have the classic Dark Dungeons Chick Tract, which denounces uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And it was recently reprinted. So if you want a copy, I'll be <laughs> handing out Chick Tracts in the lobby later. Um, so there's controversy over that. But as far as video game violence, I think what we're talking about is really something that, in terms of the public debate, starts in the 90s, although some of the media violence researchers did take an interest in it in the 80s. And I think yeah, you wanted to Yeah, focus I was on just going to say, um, I think it's important to contextualize this beyond video games. Uh, at least this is what I do with my students. So this debate actually goes way back. Uh, not just to Frederick Wortham's chastisement of consuming of comic books in the 1950s, but one can even trace this back to the reading of novels during the Victorian period when novels were thought of as basically working class, especially novelettes, working class type of entertainment that was looked down upon by the status anxiety of the emerging middle classes in that period. Um, these, the, oftentimes in the literature we talk about these as moral panics. Um, I'm not happy necessarily with the phrase because um, I think it doesn't quite adequately describe the phenomena, but nonetheless, Periodically, whenever the technology changes, whenever um, there is a rapid social change within a society, you get these large-scale movements of what Howard Becker often calls moral entrepreneurs who make their living by scaring the public, um, by connecting, uh, in a sense, correlations that have little to do with causality um, in the public's mind to try to ease their anxiety. So I think that, that one has to look at the larger perspective beyond just video games to ask the question, what do we mean by representations of violence, and is it really violence that we're talking about here, um, or is it something else that's really going on? Um, I think that those that level of debate really uh, still has not been fully addressed in this country uh, to try to deal with this issue. Um, I mean, there's more to be said, so I, I'll just stop there and let other panelists chime in here. So. <clears throat> I guess my input would be on, on the legal side to, to build on what's been said about comic books, et cetera. Laws with respect to video games, um, at least historically, we come back to some of the more substantive stuff. Uh, they do start uh, early on with uh, some laws that actually work. 
uh, at least work in the constitutional sense, in that uh, as arcades became popular, um, later than the pinball scene, more in the 80s when you started getting arcades like this guy uh, runs with cabinet games, there were uh, some challenges to like, municipal ordinances, including one, I think, in Chicago, that uh, had nothing to do with what games were there or what the violence of those games. It was more along the lines of issues of truancy. And so there were some statutes that prohibited uh, minors, uh, sort of put some uh, like a blackout period, so to speak, um, where during school during school year, during until 3 or 4 o'clock, then uh, minor folks operating an arcade had to uh, restrict access from minors. That was challenged as a, under the First Amendment, which we'll talk about in more detail, but that one was easy because it is a time, place, or manner. Nobody, the, the state or the municipality is not objecting to the content itself. It's the age of uh, it's you know, high school kids skipping school and trying to restrict uh, places they can go hang out when they're supposed to be in school. Um, that's probably one of the first examples of one of the statutes uh, <coughs> that try to regulate, well, it doesn't actually regulate content, but it's, it, it is uh, sort of obliquely relevant to it. It's the later statutes that uh, attack in the 90s, starting from Mortal Kombat. It's also around the same time that uh, everyone's uh, favorite gal, Tipper Gore, uh, took an interest in uh, record mm -hmm. uh, labeling and song lyrics. Uh, as far as uh, cursing and sexual content and uh, both in hip hop and heavy metal and other genres. Uh, those are, they're worse than Hollywood being out of ideas. Uh, it's the same statute over and over and over and then they're challenged on First Amendment grounds because they are content based uh, and they're not merely time, place, manner like the arcade stuff. Uh, and they fail for the same reasons, based on not just the same science, but the same studies that have the same flaws. Uh, and yet, uh, the states, in a sort of a hopscotch around the map, uh, would the, the lobby for this uh, would just go to another state, pitch the same kind of bunk science, uh, or at least bunk studies, uh, and uh, try to come up with some way to uh, crack down on minors uh, gaining access through your, basically a retailer to content like Mortal Kombat. Grand Theft Auto is a favorite uh, in this scene, uh, as well as some others. Finally, uh, so, so until 2010, 2011, uh, you had, like when I would teach this, maybe a dozen appellate decisions, which made for a lot of reading, but a very short lecture. It's the same case over and over and over. Yeah. Um, the only thing that changed is by the time uh, everybody's favorite uh, B Rod, uh, Mr. Bogoyevich, he got wind of this and and had uh, and got himself named as a defendant when Illinois' law passed. Um, by then, it had been beaten down for the same reasons, et cetera, et cetera, so many times that he got to the next. He got to level up his defendant status and pay seven hundred fifty thousand in attorney's fees uh, for basically passing this dumb law. Um, and so while it wasn't a circuit split, the circuits were really uniform and these laws are dumb and they don't work under the First Amendment for the same reasons we keep telling you. Uh, it did finally go to the Supreme Court after uh, the California case, which is ESA v. Brown because it was ESA v. Schwarzenegger and in the as Schwarzenegger left office, he said, yeah, I really don't even want my name on that because it's really <laughs> terrible. Um, and the Supreme Court came down echoing what all the lower courts had said uh, and has essentially resolved at least that version of the law. It still tries to bubble up um, the, the, as I said, the lobby against these things uh, really, really, really doesn't like video games, or doesn't like Grand Theft Auto, basically. Um, and so they, they keep trying to retool their approach to come up with some restriction. Uh, and it's got a lot of political mileage, because if you think about it, like for instance, the how, there was a House bill that turned up several times, or I'm sorry, a Senate bill, because sponsored by, uh, among the sponsors, included Hillary Clinton, so, uh, you know, Democrat, left, you know, the liberal side of things. Um, and why? Well, if you think about it, it's, if you're on the left and, and you go through all the other touchstone sort of social issues, uh, you know, you, obviously the, the balance sheet lines up one way, 
here's one where you can be a moral champion against video games. So you get to have some moral credibility. At the same time, who do you alienate? I mean, who's the disgruntled constituency? Uh, minors that play video games, so they can't vote anyway. So you get to sort of take a social position that doesn't really risk any of your base, uh, which is my own sort of pet theory as to why these things keep turning up. <laughs> hey, Doc, I know a question that I had for you since we've talked about arcade regulation and things like truancy for children. How do we, as an owner of an arcade, do you have to be conscious of parents bringing kids into the arcade who may or may not want to play Mortal Kombat? Like, what kind of regulations do you have to worry about at Galloping Ghosts for things like media? Um, it's it's honestly never really been an issue. And we, we have all the Mortal Kombats. We have Death Race. Um, and there's, on the arcade floor, uh, I don't think anyone has ever asked where are the violent games? What shouldn't my kids be playing? So you don't have like a curtain area? For no. So <laughs> adults only section. It's uh, and and they're kind of mixed in. Like our Mortal Kombat stuff has its own corner. Um, Death Race is right in between uh, a, a hologram game and a and Tubin, which are pretty <laughs> pretty safe games. But um, it's it's really only been an issue when we had our uh, party rooms that people bring up, uh, more so the console stuff, uh, whether that's appropriate for somebody to play. Uh, the rating system, a lot of parents still just do go by that. Um, and there's not a ton of uh, further research. It's just kind of like, is it they, they ask what's the rating on the game, and then if it's not a uh, mature rated game, they'll let them play it, even though there is violence in the game. Um, it's, but the arcade end of it, uh, again, we have a, pretty much every fighting game that you could imagine out there, um, and we've not had one issue of, of any violence. And it's such a competitive scene there that you would, initially, it was a concern. It was like, what is this going to be like? We have, now we have 500 people through the door on a Saturday. And we haven't had one issue of, of any sort of violence, no raised tempers. So it's, it's definitely, uh, in, it's all there for people to play. And there's been no adverse repercussions from any of it. So obviously we have ratings for console games. Are there ratings for arcade games in the same way? Or do people just kind of know at this point that Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter might be more violent than your average? In the, uh, in the... Prime arcade days, there used to be uh, red, green, and yellow stickers that would kind of indicate the content level of it. Um, Who issued those? I, I'm not even sure. Uh, it was so. I'm, it was not uh, on every game, but uh, I don't know if it was the arcades themselves that just kind of implemented it, or. Um, but we have so many machines that have nothing on them. It's it's there's no. Uh, content awareness on them at all. And for us, we mostly see a lot of parents that bring their kids in. And it's so common to see a father bring their kid over to Mortal Kombat 1 or 2, and they'll start up a game and, and play away. Uh, and it's, at the time, what was like an issue <laughs> has become so irrelevant. Um, that the arcade games, like the new ones that are coming out, like Street Fighter 4, King of Fighters 13, um, they're not a, they don't have the same element that they or impact on on people that they used to. Like they're still as popular, but the violence is compared to games like Grand Theft Auto. Like it's just such a different level. I think it's interesting that Mortal Kombat seemed to only become really controversial when it was ported to the home consoles, when it was put on the Genesis and the Super Nintendo, maybe because there were more children playing console games than were going to arcades. I know that I played Mortal Kombat in an arcade as a kid all the time, but didn't have any trouble until I tried to buy a copy of it at the local Funko Land where I got carded and couldn't buy it when I was 10. I remember looking at the graphics on it going, I can't buy this, really look at the pixels. Um, the home console version of Mortal Kombat uh, to navigate some of that did include the default setting uh, had left, but you had to go into options to bloody it up. Um, I think one of the reasons, I don't think the SRB does any uh, cabinet rating, but I truth be told didn't look that up. Um, the uh, ESRB, of course, is the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. It's it's like the MPAA, but for games. 
Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we get to other parts Actually, that's of the a time. good segue. Um, so we've been or we'll about talk about it now. Uh, <laughs> um, so, oh, go ahead. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Mortal Kombat. We've been talking about the ESRB. Um, Mortal Kombat obviously didn't come out until the 1990s. The ESRB was a result of Senate committee hearings about video game violence. Uh, Congress had a conversation very similar to what we're having now, talking about video games, their violent content, their sexual content, how that influences people's behavior, how to regulate that to keep it from children or get it to children, depending uh, who you were talking to. But I think that would be a good time to segue into a talk about congressional hearings and also some, I'd like to talk to you about oh, yeah. the differences about whether or not pe video games are media make people aggressive, whether or not that translates to making yeah. them violent. You want me to take that first? Yeah, take that first yeah. and then we'll go into the All right. Um, hearings. Part of what I deal with a lot is misconceptions of science, uh, which tends to be pervasive in the public realm. Um, the whole media effects debate, which has been ongoing since really really the production of film, um, and later on television, is based upon a number of different assumptions. Um, one is that there's somehow a direct correlation between exposure to imagery and behavior. Um, the evidence of that is inconclusive, as the Supreme Court has discovered and others as well. But let me just kind of lay out uh, at least four to five different models that have been used to support the social science research that attempts to try to prove a link between exposure to media imagery um, and behavior. So the first, obviously, many of you probably remember this, is the social learning theory based on the work of Alberto Bandura in 1970, in the 70s. And for those of you who remember these studies, he was known for using the uh, Bobo doll. Some of you remember, maybe you remember this, the Bobo doll is what you hit with a you know, you whack it and it comes back up again. <laughs> um, and the studies that they did at the time were experimental studies looking at children and their exposure to images and then watching how they beat up on the Bobo doll, making the assumption that if they were exposed to violent images on television that they would beat the doll up um, in, in an aggressive fashion, not, of course, realizing that that's what the purpose of the doll was in the first place, which children understood more than the researchers did about how that intention was going. Um, but, you know, we, aside from the details, the other theories that are important is that the direct descendant of the social learning theory was Craig Anderson's work, which was the general aggression model, which attempts to try to prove that there is a connection um, between aggression and exposure to violent imagery of any kind, TV, video games, media, whatever. Um, in defense of that, there's also the catharsis model, which uh, many of us can trace back to Aristotle, um, the exposure basically allows you to blow off steam. Um, and this is oftentimes the defense of the industry compared to the researchers to try to go back and forth. I think both models are incorrect. Uh, finally, the last two would be the cultivation theory of uh, George Gerbner um, at the Annenberg School of Communications, which really looks at the idea of the mean world syndrome, that somehow exposure to violent imagery may not directly cause uh, aggression, but that it produces a worldview that in fact implies that we're all messed up in this apocalypse and therefore we should all be pessimistic and blah, blah, blah. That fades into the more recent theories called desensitization, which assumes that somehow exposure to many violent images will make people less sensitive to actual real violence. The problem with all of these theories, and there's many problems with these theories, aside from the fact that most of them are done in laboratories that have little impact on real life settings, um, is that there's a direct connection in their minds between what people who actually consume media do and the sense that they make out of what they do. In other words, the idea of social meaning is left out entirely of all these experiments. We don't listen to what children say they do. We don't listen to what they think they do and we don't look at what adults think and say they do. We have these preconceptions of what already exists, therefore the models that we use to do the research are already prejudiced in the beginning because we look for the results that we intend to find in the first place. Um, they're not results that we look at scientifically, it's actually what I would call pseudoscience, which is why the media effects debates are now pretty well sunk in the psychological literature. If you were to go to a psychology department, the only people pursuing these lines of research tend to be those who have grant money to do so. Um, and so there is a certain kind of charlatanism involved in this. I think you see this with Craig Anderson's work, with uh, Jack Armstrong's work, uh, 
And you also see this, obviously, with the most obvious is David Grossman's work, um, who attempts to try to connect the idea of, of uh, exposure to violence with the actual idea of mass killings. Um, there's a lot of resistance to try to understand this critique, which is why I find I'm kind of flabbergasted by why these people don't want to look at the real science, because it's for some reason disturbing, and it undercuts the idea that somehow there's a moral continuity in the social order that we should all be following. In fact, people have different conceptions about what's real, what's violent, what's sexual, quite a few of the things. The regulation of that, of which is often what law is about. Um, the couple things I mentioned, uh, what I tell my students is I think Karen Sternheimer's book, It's Not the Media, is one of the best work, uh, works out there for the popular masses to read. She actually does an excellent job of analyzing uh, this relationship we talked about. Um, she makes a point, actually, of visiting a morgue of gunshot victims and noticing the difference between what, uh, it, what real violence looks like compared to what fictional violence. I often tell my students that I asked them if anybody has ever shot a rifle before, and I said, well, I've shot an AR-15, you know, I've shot a German Mauser. Um, I know what they sound like, what it looks like, and, and the kicks that they have. And I said, it's nothing like operating a keyboard with a mouse. Um, <laughs> doesn't work the same way. So the actual physicality of violence that we associate with crime is never the part that gets into the debate. Rather, we assume that that physicality of violence is somehow equated with the visual aspect, rather it's a slasher film, or a violent video game, when in fact there is absolutely no distinction between the two. It's a quite a jump to make a jump between the visual and the actual embodiment of the notion of the image itself. And to make that jump would require you to have to think of a whole host of other variables that are involved in changing people's psyche to make them want to make a decision to commit actual crime. Um, and I think that those are the variables that often get left out of the studies and of the discussion as well. Like this, that's, it's easier to talk about video game violence than to talk about gun control, or rather than to talk about the issue of poverty. Um, and to back this up, and I'll make this one last point, um, there was an interesting study done, uh, let's see if I've got it here, it was actually done in England some time ago, to look at offenders and their actual consumption of media. And what is interesting to note is if you actually look at people who commit uh, juvenile crimes, or even crimes that, um, for adults, the actual rate of media consumption is quite low. The um, notion of actually consuming violent games is quite low. We get exceptional cases now and then. I remember the case that just came out with um, what was the shootings in New Hampshire that happened, right, where he was supposedly playing World of Warcraft, but then 15 million people play World of Warcraft. Um, so where do you draw the line uh, by one person uh, being off center. So this idea, it raises one other question which we haven't talked about, which is the idea that in the public's mind, one spectacular crime becomes equivalent to a whole body of, of effects, which in fact has little correlation, but has great spectacle and sensational value. Um, I mean, it's the same reason for 9-11, right? You make one large terrorist attack and everybody freaks out about it. Um, as horrific as it is, it then becomes generalized to the larger population um, as a form of anti-Muslim hatred. And I think that this kind of problem with stereotyping and risk-taking is also evidenced in some of the debates that go on around media and violence as well. So, Can I wait yeah. on one point? Um, you referenced Dave Grossman's yeah, work, yeah. and, and I, I, I'd like to offer a couple of thoughts on that. I do view the media violence researchers as actual social scientists doing actual social science. It's fair to say it's inconclusive. It's fair to say there are problems. And I don't think it actually supports the laws that were enacted. But I'm reluctant to, to put Grossman in the same category. Grossman is not a social scientist. He does not do social True. science research. He did test, we'll talk about committees in a moment, but he did testify before uh, several of the states that enacted laws. And so I think it's important to note that his argument is in a, is in a very different category. Uh, his, his argument, in brief, is that you can condition people to kill, and you can actually do it very easily. He tells a, a story which, when you hear him speak, sounds very compelling. He's a great speaker. He speaks with great confidence. He doesn't speak like Craig Anderson, who speaks like a social scientist. <laughs> he speaks with incredible confidence and certainty about his argument. What he tells, the story he tells, is that if you go to, back to World War II, 
you'll actually find that relatively few soldiers were willing to fire their weapons at enemy combatants, even in situations where their lives were at risk. He says that only about 15 to 20 percent of the soldiers would fire their weapons at enemy combatants in World War II, maybe up to 25 percent in some situations. Now it changed after World War II. By the time of Vietnam and later, we're up into the 90 percentages. Now why the big change? According to Grossman, it's because in World War II, soldiers trained on bullseye targets. And after World War II, there was a switch to silhouette targets. And by firing repeatedly at a silhouette target, you can overcome the natural resistance to kill. Now that's rather striking. If you can go from 15 to 20 percent to 90 percent simply by changing from a bullseye target to a silhouette target. Now there's actually no social science to support this. And in fact, the figure he uses of 15 to 20 percent is almost certainly wrong. It's almost certainly a figure that was made up by a, uh, a man named S.L.A. Marshall who was a historian in the military and who likely used the figure just to get attention for his overall argument that there needed to be changes in training. And there were changes in training. Grossman's done nothing to isolate the various changes that happened over the years such that he could say that the change in target structure is the one that accounts for the purported difference in firing rates, which again I don't think is accurate to begin with. Um, but if you buy Grossman's argument, we're talking about a different category of games that's a problem. So this is probably the worst game ever made, <laughs> if you believe Grossman's argument, because here you are firing with a plastic gun. This is Hogan's Alley if you're far in the back. And here you are firing with a plastic gun at essentially silhouette pop-up targets. This would train children to kill. Now, according to the media violence researchers, this might be violent, but you are firing at an inanimate object. So some might say yes, some might say no. But according to Grossman, this is the sort of game that we should be particularly worried about. But he doesn't have any evidence for that. When he testified before some of the state legislatures, he referred to scholarly studies. But I've never seen him cite a scholarly study. I don't know what he relies on for his claims. And to the extent he's relying on SLA Marshall, the numbers just aren't remotely convincing. Um, maybe that's a segue into the committee discussion. If you say so taking all of that sociology, mm -hmm. How have lawmakers taken that information or ignored that information and used it to craft public policy yeah. through the, the committee hearings in 93 and 94? I can, I can, well, not necessarily the committee hearings, but I can backfill where the, all these studies, uh, well, I keep saying, uh, and it's not fair to say bunk sites, but they're bunk studies. Why they fail? Because they fail for the same two basic reasons. Mm -hmm. One is this chicken and egg problem. So mm -hmm. you see these anecdotal stories of, Columbine or one of these other horrific mass shootings, uh, first thing they do when they search the kid's room is they find all the pipe bombs and other silliness, and then they find Doom right. or Grand Theft Auto <laughs> or you know, some other shooting game, and aha, that game made him kill. Okay. And so, and, and the studies uh, in, in the cases on these laws uh, look to that connection as, as a you know, kind of pound the table. Uh, element. The problem with that, that the courts immediately spot, is, well, is it violent video games turn Johnny into a killer, or Johnny was kind of messed up in the head, and as it turns out, while he ultimately liked shooting other school, along the way, he also liked shooting other things. And so, is it sort of a, a character issue or a mental health issue that uh, that? increases an appetite for something like a Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty or what have you, um, or vice versa. And the studies, even these studies that are really aimed in that direction, they can't get past that chicken egg problem. The other uh, problem that the, the, the argument and a lot of the studies have is they're sort of flawed from the start. And the reason I say that is they're tasked with video games. That's got to be the problem. That's what you need to, that's what you, social scientists, et cetera, should focus on. Why? Because of hate for video games? Maybe. Also because the cow is out the barn on a bunch of other content, right? So if there's anything to this, if you're exposed to violent images or you're exposed to et cetera, et cetera, and it's going to make you more violent or desensitize you or what have you, there's no way they'll get a law that gets to movies because that's just too well settled. There's no, there's no way a court or a legislature could look back and say, you know, we shouldn't have let Sam Peckinpah make movies that have all that blood in them 
and now we know better. That's done. That's not going to happen. So they have to come up with evidence and an argument that zeroes in on the new media mm -hmm. because that's the only one that's really on yeah. deck. Um, and so a lot of these studies, they try to isolate it to video games, but they don't essentially account for or control for what about all the other violent content, which would still get you to the chicken and egg. I mean, if, if it turns out I'm you know, wired to at some point go nuts and kill a bunch of people, probably along the way I'm going to read horrific stories and watch lots of violent films and play some violent games and you know, tear the wings off flies. All those things are going to happen. Um, but the, the chicken and egg issue exists. Well, there, uh, I think we need to be careful about what the, the media violence researchers typically claim, and again, setting Grossman aside. Mm -hmm. uh, so the claim by somebody like Craig Anderson is that exposure to violent media increases the probability that you will behave or think aggressively. Now, he actually said when he testified in Michigan, no one claims, this is a rough quote, no one claims that a well-adjusted 15-year-old who plays a violent video game will become a mass murderer. Obviously, it doesn't work that way. So, yeah, we're talking about people who have pre-existing problems, but the claim, if we're talking about really violent behavior. Right. Um, but the, the claim is it increases the probability. And the way you control for exposure to other media is, in part, through a laboratory study. Now, there are reasonable criticisms of doing a laboratory study. It's an unnatural environment. It may only show short-term effects. But the idea is you randomly assign one group to the, the violent treatment and then one group to the nonviolent treatment and then you try to measure and there are problems with these measurements but you try to measure if there's an increase in aggression in the people exposed to the violence um, now I actually don't think the science was all that important in the state legislatures mm -hmm. that enacted this I, I really don't think it, it was about science it, at least in three states I think it's fairly clear that what you had was one member of the legislature who took a particular interest in this issue. And the interest was tied probably to something more along the lines of shock at certain particularly violent games, like maybe Grand Theft Auto. And there was also often a misunderstanding. Many legislators thought that Grand Theft Auto allowed uh, players to rape women in the game, which is not a feature of any of the Grand Theft Autos. I know there's a random event in Grand Theft Auto V that provoked some debate about whether a rape was depicted. Uh, Rockstar clarified, no, no, it was about cannibalism, so it's not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we can speak but, freely. <laughs> but it, it wasn't player controlled in any event. Uh, but that was in Grand Theft Auto V. None of the earlier games feature something uh, where somebody rapes somebody, but many of the legislatures thought it did. So I think what you have is some legislator who is shocked at the content of a game, and they take a particular interest in this and then push a bill through a legislature that um, is, is not particularly knowledgeable about the subject matter. Uh, it may be rather surprising to know that not only did the state legislatures do a bad job of reviewing the science, and I think it's because they really didn't care about it, uh, they actually didn't do a good job of reviewing the games either. So if you were on one of the committees that was supposed to consider one of these bills, what would you have seen? You would have seen a clip reel of maybe four minutes in length. Now imagine that you were going to regulate movies and you saw a clip reel that showed a few out of context scenes from Saw and Hostel, and that's the whole show. Uh, it probably wouldn't give you a very good sense of what movies are like, and you have to imagine that you've never seen very many movies, because that's how many of the legislators were with regard to games. They weren't that familiar with them. So they'd watch a clip reel of just a couple of minutes. In fact, in California, at one hearing, uh, the chair gave one minute to Leland Yee to show the clip, and when it went 30 seconds over, the chair got very upset and said, turn it off. So a minute 30 was enough. Um, so they didn't really know much about the games, but you still had a member who was particularly focused on the issue, and that was definitely true in Washington, Minnesota, and California. I'm not so sure about the other states. Um, I don't know that there was really any lobby that pushed it through. I think it was really about uh, a policy entrepreneur in the legislature who, who had an interest in this. Uh, and then when it comes time for the whole uh, body to vote on it, nobody really knows anything about what happened at the committee. They assume there's been some discussion of science that supports what's going on, and I think the references to science were just to try to appease the courts. Uh, there, there was no serious discussion in the committees about the science. Um, you know, Grossman testified for uh, a somewhat lengthy time by legislative committee standards in Washington, but I don't think he even counts as an expert. 
Michigan had Craig Anderson call in for 15 minutes on the speakerphone and talk. Uh, there were a few decent questions answered, but there was no in-depth discussion of any of the studies. Uh, the chair claimed to have read one or two studies. He probably read the introduction and the conclusion and skimmed <laughs> them at all. Um, so not much really happened with the science in the legislatures. Uh, and then it goes to the whole body, and somebody from the committee would say, well, we heard about the science. There's a problem here. Uh, the discussion is mainly about particularly violent games, and that's actually a bit of a problem. The social science research, if you accept it, doesn't support the idea that you should only target graphic violence. In fact, graphic violence may be less of a problem because it illustrates the consequences of violence and therefore may reduce aggression. It may increase desensitization, but it may decrease aggression. Now, none of the legislators figured that out because none of them did anything serious with the science. Um, so they were targeting extra violent games for the most part, graphically violent, explicitly violent, for the most part. Washington had kind of an oddball statute that focused just on violence that was against police officers and it didn't have to be particularly graphic. And as an interesting side note, the reason for that is that the committee chair, uh, she said this on two occasions that I've seen, she said, the courts want our laws to be narrowly tailored. So what would be narrower than a law that focuses only on violence against law enforcement? Mm -hmm. Now, conveniently, stores won't know which games feature violence against law enforcement, so they will restrict access to all M-rated games. Um, now, that ignores the fact that non-M-rated games might feature uh, violence against law enforcement. If you play Rampage, you can step on little SWAT team members, and they're actually somewhat photographic, uh, somewhat realistic in, in appearance. Um, but she seemed to think that this would allow the, the state to regulate access to M-rated games indirectly, and you'd get it past the courts. And the courts said no. In fact, there isn't any social science research one way or the other that singles out um, violence against law enforcement as being a problem. So the court threw that one out. But in all the other states, they're targeting extra violent um, depictions. And again, the social science really doesn't support doing that, even if you accept it. Um, so you might think of it as a sort of obscenity type argument, which ultimately the Supreme Court rejected in Brown. So we're not going to put violence in the same category yeah, we're as obscenity. Hold up on Brown. Um, <laughs> but you have members who are shocked. And uh, you know, I, I want to bring our own Senator Mike Jacobs from Illinois into this, following up what you said. Um, why did he vote for this? He admitted that if, he, if the bill passed in Illinois, it would likely cost the state a half million dollars. But he said he has to vote for it anyway. Here's why. Quote, it's going to end up on a mail piece that I'm somehow for violent and crazy video games and seniors don't get that. Um, so there was a worry that this would be used against them. I don't know that there was really much uh, lobbying in favor of it. The lobbying against it was somewhat weak. Legislators are worried that it will be used against them. Uh, so it looks like an easy vote in favor of the bill, and in this case, he even thought it would be struck down by the courts. Um, others may have thought that as well, so the problem would just go away. Um, but again, I don't think the science has a lot to do with what's going on. It's sort of a, uh, everybody wants somebody to come in and just verify. Scientists tell us there's a problem here, right? Thanks, good, give me a study, I'll stick it in the file in the record. When it comes time for litigation, we'll take the file folder over to the court, and then the court will be convinced that there's a scientific basis for what we've done. But nobody wanted to hear any detail um, about the science. There was no kind of thorough review of the science in any state legislature. Uh, experts didn't necessarily testify. You didn't get experts on both sides, even if you did have an expert, and that was rare. And they might only talk for 15 minutes, which isn't remotely enough time. Okay. I just want to make a quick point, because I think Bill is raising some really important uh, questions here. Also questions about the science. Uh, part of the critique that I've done before is that the, the way the studies are often accomplished, and I think I notice you have ill effects here, uh, which is a, a great little book um, called actually The Media of Violence and Its Effect on Aggression by Friedman, which is a review of studies was done. But there's actually a book called Ill Effects, The Media of Violence Debate by um, uh, Martin Barker and Julian Petley, it's an edited volume, which has some excellent reviews. David, um, uh, I believe it's David uh, Gauntlet, has laid out ten things wrong with how media science is actually conducted. I won't get it. You can look at, actually on the web and see his ten uh, points. But I think what this comes back to at a, at a level of science is the way in which the actual discipline of behavioral psychology, and I would argue also developmental psychology, has constructed a notion of representation of the self 
that in fact tends to ignore uh, either explicitly or implicitly the idea of social meaning. Uh, that is, we don't listen to children, we don't listen to adults, what actually game playing means to them. We assume that we know what that means to them because of our assumptions and the models that we use to test uh, our variables. But in fact, very few qualitative studies have been done that actually show the long-term impacts or show what, in fact, people get out of this, the play that they engage in. Uh, part of the work I've been doing with Counter-Strike players and World of Warcraft players is precisely to look at what meanings they have about the, the game playing that they do and how those meanings are refracted through race, class, and gender type issues. This doesn't mean that the media issue of game, gaming is unproblematic. We all know this. There are stereotypes of race and sex that involve in all these issues. Um, but we have to be able to differentiate between the stereotypes that are produced in content, uh, the narratives that are being told, and the meanings that players themselves get out of these contents. Um, if we make a straight assumption even about trash talking, for example, that it's often made on an invidious basis of, of anger or hatred, we would often miss the idea of things like humor, um, uh, things like um, parodies, um, satire, often which may, in a sense, when you have people that you don't know that you're playing with, may go un unnoticed. Uh, and so there's a lot of miscommunication that goes on between players. I've said before that it's oftentimes not the problem of the imagery itself, although politicians like to think that it is. It's more of a problem of intercommunication between game players themselves, how they talk to each other. Um, the kind of talking that goes on, the kind of insults that get passed around are often more harmful than the game itself. And that is a debate that probably we'll have later when we talk about Gamergate and other types of controversies around that. For sure. Now, some of the content that we've been talking about, generally, it's just been called obscene. So we have yeah. some violent content. We have some highly sexualized content. There seems to be a line drawn somewhere in between. No one really knows where it is on when it's okay to mm -hmm. regulate sexualized content for children versus violent content. The Let me tell you something. To, uh, the ESRB seems to just put a sticker on something and say this is violent for children. Sexual content, obviously, we have no trouble regulating. But getting into Brown and talking about expressive works, what protections are there for violent works as expression versus sexual works as expression, and how are we trying to legislate for one but maybe not the other? Okay, let me unpack a whole bunch of things you've just said. Um, I'm going to sideline the ESRB um, because the actually it's a lot more involved than just a sticker, and it's also not just focused on violence. But let's go with Brown first, because that's frankly easier. Uh, so it all begins with Congress shall make no law restricting the freedom of speech and a bunch of other things. 14th Amendment means... Congress now becomes state actors of every stripe, can make no law restricting speech. Uh, from that baseline, you have two kinds of ways the state may run afoul of this prohibition of restricting speech. One is content-based. In other words, the state, Congress, municipality, this, Illinois, what have you, uh, doesn't like some element of speech because of what you say. Um, as opposed to time, place, manner, which is it's not important what you're saying, or at least is less relevant what you're saying, as opposed to where you were saying it or when. So if you want to shout racist stuff, shame on you, but the law can't stop you. If you do it through a loudspeaker late at night, they maybe can stop you. Why? Because it's late at night. It really doesn't matter whether you're saying racist stuff or you're just playing you know, the Barney theme. doesn't matter. <laughs> Which is why, as I said before, things like early regulation of uh, minors' access to arcades, because it was a focus of truancy and where they and when they were there, irrespective of what the games were, uh, that's easier to do. But you make that division, the state's burden when these laws are challenged is one of strict scrutiny if it's content-based. Strict scrutiny is kind sort of a con law way of saying the state loses. Uh, or rational basis, which is a con law way of saying the state really, unless they're completely dumb, wins. Uh, and so these statutes that we talk about uh, in the cases that are just the recurring bad penny uh, work like so. Uh, games that have violent content or violent video games will be a defined term, which will spell out all sorts of things that depict blood and gore, uh, violence against 
uh, children. They sometimes, the California statute, try to make a distinction between humans and aliens, which makes for funny imagery because if you put pointy ears on the cops, you can just blow them away. But otherwise, uh, you know, there's problems. So they wrestle with, is it fantasy violence? Is it realistic violence? Um, is it somewhere in between? If your game meets that definition, then the, the, the legal restriction wasn't that it was contraband. It wasn't where they were going to you know, collect them like, like, say, child pornography, which is absolutely <laughs> contraband. Uh, it was a restriction on retailers uh, requiring uh, them to check to see if they could sell it to minors. Uh, so, obscenity. They also, by the way, all these statutes also had similar provisions for sexualized content. Those tend to stand, and here's why. So Congress shall make no law. First question is, is it speech? Because if it's speech, then we got to see if it's content-based or time, place, or manner. But it's got to be speech first. There are certain things that are not speech. Obscenity is not speech. So purely obscene material, read pornography. Uh, although the level for it, you know, know it when you see it, etc., cetera, uh, has made it a fairly small subset. But sexualized, hypersexualized content uh, can be subject to regulation for two reasons. One, at a certain level, it's, quote, obscenity, which doesn't meet the speech definition. That's what's known as a Miller test. These statutes didn't even go for Miller. They went for a later test called Ginsburg. And what that case stands for is there is content that's not quite obscene because the definition of obscenity has gotten to a really fringe stuff. So the sort of pornography that I've told lots of people enjoy on the Internet uh, which does not necessarily qualify as obscene, is still subject to Ginsburg. And what Ginsburg says is there is speech that is not obscene, so it is still speech. But depending upon its audience, the state can still regulate it on a content restriction. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to be of a certain age to go and to view pornography. Um, not because it's not speech, but because it falls into the Ginsburg world where the state can regulate access to that based on the viewer's age. Uh, so no pornography for minors, which is sad for a lot of minors. <laughs> um, the video game folks like that idea because that's an easier target. Trying to ban this content outright, they've already movies are out the door, so they, they've, they've got an uphill battle. But surely these horrific video games uh, shouldn't be in the hands of precious children. And so that's why these statutes would be aimed at you had to card somebody or you had to uh, or you could be uh, you the retailer would face a fine. Uh, if you sold what was defined by the state as violent video game content to a minor. Um, the circuit courts that dealt with this and then ultimately endorsed uh, by and embraced, frankly, by the Brown court said that, yes, violence is not sex. A lot of people don't like them. A lot of the same people don't like both of them. But sex, which is what fuels the concept of obscenity, is a very different creature than violence. For a couple of reasons. One's articulated by the courts are violence exists in all these other media and it's essentially it's too impossible to sort through, unlike sex. In other words, you know, the, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey have a violent depictions, to, uh, amputations, decapitations, and all those sorts of things that <coughs> on paper could fit the bill for other hyperviolent content, but truly we're not talking about carding kids to buy the Iliad. Um, Another uh, reason it's not quite spelled out by the court is, if you think about it, with very few exceptions, there's no kind of analog for violent content, that, for, uh, for pornography in violent content. In other words, there are no videos with a very hastily written script about a pizza delivery that turn into a spattery blood fest, right? Whereas I'm told because I've read about it in People Magazine, that those sorts of films exist uh, on the Internet. Uh, and so you don't have the same, it just doesn't parallel as well. And so once, and so in Brown, the, the folks on the side of, of these laws, uh, essentially recognizing that they may not be able to fit into obscenity, but asserted that for the same policy reasons, we want to protect children from violence, and we already do that with Ginsburg, so we need to do it with violence. Uh, you know, we do it through Ginsburg with sexualized content. We need to do it for violent content. And the court rejected that, again, because of this, there's too much baby in the bathwater. We can't sort through uh, what would be violent. 
Um, other speech issues, that, by the way, with these laws were uh, that on top of this, you've got to check ID and can't do the transaction with the minor, um, was the, uh, there were certain uh, postings that, uh, like stickers that have to go on the games that met this criteria. And so, the, again, just as the government can't stop you from speaking absent certain tests, the government also can't compel you to speak absent certain circumstances. So there was a, that was also a speech issue of uh, the, the labeling requirement. Um, so there, there's First Amendment law to Gallup, huh? <laughs> okay, so since we're running short on time now, I'm going to do one more question for the entire panel, and then we're going to move on to your own questions. Uh, for this last one, I want to start with Doc to give you a chance to jump in here, and then we're going to bring it down the line. So in terms of violent content and the way that games are moving forward with new technologies, enhanced graphics, uh, virtual reality with the Oculus Rift, as a game developer, what kind of content would you be putting in your game? Are you aware of violent content, what kind of things you want to put in, not put in, and then after we hear from you on that one, I want to move into how things like the Oculus Rift and virtual reality will affect the physicality of games and how people interact with games more directly. And for, for the game that we're working on, uh, it's a, a fighting game. Um, due to We use live actors uh, similar to the older Mortal Kombat's, which was initially one of the concerns when those games came out. They, they the concern was, since this the artwork was real people instead of just drawings, would uh, that affect people differently? Um, uh, the, everybody in our game, it's all live actors shot in HD. Uh, that makes it a little more difficult to to use in a like Mortal Kombat. They use more of a gore aspect, where you're decapitating people, you're ripping arms off. Um, with our game. It, it is. It, it went for almost more of an artistic, violent aspect to it. Um, which, and there were times, like, even talking with the actors, where they were like, are they going to be all right filming this? And honestly, like, everybody was fine with all of it. It's, uh, it's different, though. It's definitely more popular to go with heavy gore right now than with, um, like, an artistic violence level, which hasn't really been done too much. Uh, most everything, like games like Call of Duty and everything so gun-based now that uh, it, it's just different in comparison to older games. Awesome. Uh, Tal, can you take us through some of the physicality of future games like Oculus Rift? Are we going to see things like little <coughs> murder simulators where you're stabbing people with physical actions? Are we going to see oh, sex boy. simulators? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to speculate toys? on where this is um, going to go. Those are already uh, out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean no. clearly there's a lot of work being done on virtual reality simulators using um, headsets. Um, and most of you know if you've been, to, if anybody's ever been to E3 and tried out some of the uh, virtual, uh, the headsets that they initially had, I tried one, and, and it's taken a long time to get the software to the point where you don't throw up after these things. Um, because obviously the coordination between your inner ear and your eye and what you see can create quite a bit of a problem. Now, a lot of that's been resolved using software, uh, which then raises the issue of content. And it goes back again to the question of forms of media. Um, I always like to tell people, I said, when they first show the great train robbery, which was the first film ever produced, people ran out of the movie theater thinking the train was going to hit them. Um, and so I think that in the sense as these technological developments increase, it takes a while for the public to adapt to what the actual difference is between the reality of the imagery that you're experiencing and the reality that your body is experiencing. Um, you know, I think the point is that we don't give people enough credit. Uh, I don't think we give children enough credit for making distinctions between fantasy and reality. And I would th say, if anything, the people that have the hardest distinction to make are the adults and not the children. Uh, they tend to be a little more savvy about what's fantasy and what's not uh, compared to some of the adults who tend to conflate the two. Um, so I think that it's not saying that these things couldn't be problematic. I mean, clearly, I think what it points to is the issue of storytelling. Um, we often say in the science studies around video games that there's a distinction between, or used to be a distinction between what they call ludology, that is the, the idea of play versus narratology, the idea of telling stories. Uh, I think that debate's somewhat muted these days because they tend to have merged that the idea of play itself involves storytelling as we see even going back to the Greek classics of Odysseus and others. 
So I think that when we bring the technology involved in this, some of the concern that people have uh, in the scientific community as well as in the political community is the issue of will this intensified notion of identification with the imagery by your physical involvement actually lead to more aggressive behaviors. But I'll go back again to the point. What do we define as aggression? And what, why, is we, why do we think of aggression as a bad thing? When people play football, we think aggression is a good thing. Uh, when they play basketball and sports, we think aggression is a good thing. Why do we suddenly assume that when you're aggressive, let's say, assuming that you are, playing a video game, that's that somehow a bad thing? So I think the context of aggression, the idea of what aggression actually is, is often not seriously discussed. Uh, rather, it's made upon a sense of common sense assumptions about that. Rather, it's from intensified technology allows you to connect, right, with the narrative of the game or not. Um, and so I would argue that what needs to be talked about is not necessarily the violence, but what do we mean by aggression? Um, and this is definitely not clear in the literature, in the scientific literature. There's, they're all over the map with how they define what either violence representations are or what aggression is. So I think this would apply even to the technology, right, of virtual development. Um, I mean, one could easily see this being used for nefarious purposes, right? Um, one could see it from political purposes. I've said before, the left often criticizes the issue of popular culture and mass media from the standpoint of not producing revolutionaries and people wanting to question the capitalist system. The right, on the other hand, critiques it from the standpoint of the idea of moral turpitude. So and in both cases, what you have is a lack of distinction between what people make out of the stories that they consume and the play that they engage in. So I'll leave it at that. So with that, uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. You can come down to the microphone here, and uh, that way we can all hear you, and we can, we'll probably be able to have time for two questions. So there's a, there's a concept in, you know, First Amendment law that, you know, you shouldn't limit adults to that which is fit for children. And there's also this other related concept that, you know, I shouldn't have to agree with the message to agree with you know, somebody's ability or right or the option to have that message expressed. And I think that's what kind of gets lost. You know, we talk a lot about the children or this gun or that, you know, but let's look at the, the whole other side of the spectrum and, you know, the fact that other forms of media get the benefit of that full spectrum for adults. And if you need any evidence of this, if you just look at the console market, you know, for all the things that they do in Grand Theft Auto, I mean, there's lots of lines they don't cross. There's a thing, you know, the M rating is as far as anybody goes. And since Custer's Revenge, you know, that's, that's the exception that proves a rule. I mean, um, you know, do I want games where you can, uh, you know, do I, do I want Baghdad, Baghdad Fraggers 2015 and you can go and mow down innocent children? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I think that's, we need, you know, something offensive that's going to just walk right up to the line to define those perimeters you know, for everybody else. And I, I, th I think it's a market-based fa failure because you have Nintendo, you have Sony, you have Microsoft, and between them they all agree that they will not license an adult-rated game. And if there was one that came out, Sony came out tomorrow with Gong Bangers, you know, you're telling me that wouldn't sell? It would sell. So, you know, my question is what needs, you know, do you, do you agree that there's a market-based failure there? what needs to be done if you, you know, besides waiting for all the baby, baby boomers to finally die. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> for the law to catch up with <laughs> common sense and uh, for the market to catch up with common sense. Actually, the market is what has kept the, these policy entrepreneurs, or I guess I keep saying lobbyists, but I suppose they're not registered, uh, uh, sort of on the back foot because the really... Uh, because between the ESRB rating system and its implementation, which is a self-regulatory system, much like the films, uh, there is an early case, by the way, where some municipality back in like 1970 tried to criminalize letting kids into R-rated movies, and the court at a district court level said, "Yeah, no, you don't get to do that um, because you'd be having private actors writing laws, so you have a mm -hmm. due process issue." In any event, uh, the market for the really horrible games. Custer's Revenge is about as horrible a game as you can come up with. Um, Postal, uh, some of these others. That those games are either not rated because 
they're not going to get any kind of a rating, or they're rated A only. And you can go to the ESRB website to see what games are rated AO. It won't take you long. There's like a dozen, maybe. Um, the market effect, antitrust laws notwithstanding, are, as you point out, Microsoft, Sony, uh, Microsoft, Sony, uh, Nintendo. Uh, if you want to make a game for that console, it has to be rated. If it's not rated, it won't run. I mean, that's just part of the pressing, part of the manufacturing and coding process. If it's rated AO, it will not run. Um, and so in the development contract, it will say it's got to go through its rating process, and that rating has got to come in. Sometimes it will say it's got to come in at T, or if nothing else, it has to be M or below. Uh, or it won't run our console. On top of that, even if the console folks didn't say that, Target, Walmart, Toys R Us, all of your retail chains will not sell a game that's not rated. So the rating system, while it is a private, it's self-regulatory, it, it doesn't have the power of the state behind it, although it does have some very uh, substantial uh, teeth um, because within the rating system there are fines and there are, you know, games can get pulled. And if you are kicked out of the rating system, like if you were a repeat offender, you're also kicked out of Target and Walmart and Toys R Us and everywhere else you'd want to sell that game. So the market in that sense, has rejected the really extreme game. Now, leave aside the, the, your, your point on should people be able to say these things? Yes. If people, you know, free speech means you've got to suffer the Ku Klux Klan just as much as you have to suffer Greenpeace or whatever. Um, that's why we don't look at the content. They get to say whatever they want to say. Um, the market, however, uh, while it may not be an organic market reaction, uh, the, a bunch of the big players have decided it's not worth it for our platform to be a speech platform um, if it's in a kind of a consumer politics sense going to alienate a market such that, you know, Microsoft agrees, Sony agrees, Target agrees. We, we are not interested in having, uh, in being as a free speech platform if it's going to drive mom and dad away at Christmas. And so that is, to, in my view, a big market solution, so to speak, to this whole dilemma and what leaves the regulatory efforts aimed at stuff that's not quite over the fence. Because nobody's going to defend Postal. It's going to sit on the fringe list on the ESRB and there are some people who will buy it and I don't judge them for it, but it's just not, it's not going to set the market on fire. But that's the way it is, but is that the way that you agree it should be? I mean, Postal, all those, all those AO games are strictly PC niche games, not right, generally available. You know, right. I mean, there's, there's, there is this thing called the Sherman Act and, you know, hasn't yeah, been enforced very much. And you've got I three know. companies that control the entire universe of what's available for all the adults that want to play console games. Is that the way it should be? Yeah, I mean, there is the Sherman Act and, and that's why I equipped earlier the antitrust laws notwithstanding because it does have a bit of a cartel smell um, <laughs> uh, because of the collaboration. But individually, Microsoft could, could go alone on that and then you wouldn't have a Sherman problem and you would still have Postal not being able to run that platform and that's kind of a freedom of contract issue. Like I want a platform that, remember, the games industry is not just marketed to players. Mom and dad and grandma buy games too, um, which is why they embrace this rating system, as to, both to get ahead of the regulatory efforts but also as a communication device, which is why I remarked earlier that it's not just is it violent, is it not violent. The ESRB system actually uh, factors in quite a number of things, drug use, cigarettes, alcohol, uh, violence certainly, uh, sexual content, um, and it's kind of like when you watch HBO, adult situations. All of those things are factored into the rating and the rating system has got stages where there's a letter on the front of the box, you know, M for mature, etc. The back of the box has a bit more with a couple of the Y's that say M on the front. Well, it's got this, it's got this, it's got this. And then further into the materials, uh, if you look on their site or usually within inside the box, is an even more elaborate uh, description of why it got rated the way it did. I actually have to call it a time right there. We're right at our max. So I want to thank Sorry. all of our speakers for answering all of my questions and as many as we could get to right now. We're going to be back in 15 minutes with the recent developments in video game law panel. And I'd also like to remind everyone that on the second floor we have a video game law museum. You can go and check out all of the games that we've been talking about today, some of the legislation that helped lead to our legal status in games today, as well as play a game of Mortal Kombat. So but sadly, uh, there will uh, not uh, be a Custer's Revenge tournament. Uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> That's good.